On this edition of Independent Sources, Brooklyn buyout. What now for nurses at the troubled Long Island College Hospital after months of protest lead to a last minute reprieve? Privatizing public housing. New York City's housing authorities plan to build market rate units in public housing sites draw stern criticism. And Millennial Forum. Young Democrats ask serious questions of four mayoral candidates. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Diana Ravinka. And I'm Zyphus Lebrun, standing in for Gary Pierre Pierre. For months, nurses at Long Island College Hospital and other Brooklyn residents protested the proposed closure of the Cobble Hill Hospital. LICH's owner, SUNY Downstate Medical Center, claimed that the closure was important to save them from a bad investment that was losing an estimated $1 million a week. But a recent last-minute reprieve after the city council and Governor Cuomo stepped in has given the hospital a second lease on life, at least for now. Now, there's another deadline looming. This time, it's for SUNY Downstate that needs to find a new owner for the financially strapped hospital. I spoke with Michelle Green of the New York State Nurses Association about the current conditions at the hospital and what they want going ahead. Mickey Green, thank you for joining us in studio today. Thank you. Before That's we start the conversation, I'd like to let our viewers know that we did invite someone from SUNY Downstate to be a part of the conversation, but they denied us a studio interview. They did issue us a statement, which read in part, SUNY's focus right now is solely on developing a legally required plan to make Downstate Medical Center financially viable for the long term. That plan encompasses the hospitals as well as our College of Medicine, our schools that educate nurses, and other healthcare professionals. It went on to say, we've issued a formal request to hospital operators and healthcare providers to see if there's interest in providing medical care in the LICH community up to and including a running an acute care hospital. Uh, Mickey, uh, what are some of your thoughts about this statement uh, from SUNY? Well, it is true. They have um, been, um, they're required now to su submit to the state a sustainability plan um, to explain how they can run the hospitals and run their school. Okay, and uh, what's your, um, what's the feeling now on the ground for some of the nurses after this recent uh, reprieve, if you will, that, uh, that we got? Well, uh, we're hopeful. Um, the nurses have been in a long struggle uh, with community groups, elected officials, and uh, this has been going on for several months now. If SUNY had its way, this hospital would have been closed. They would be building condos now, luxury condos, where um, the hospital now stands, where patients are being cared for, where nurses are taking care of patients. So we are hopeful uh, that there will be um, a new operator. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like we jumped the gun just a little bit. So let's talk just a little bit about how we got here and where here is as regards to the situation with uh, LICH and SUNY. So if we just backtrack a little bit and tell us, you know, how we got to this point. Well, SUNY, um, the S State University of New York um, responded to a request from SUNY Downstate to close Long Island College Hospital. And this was supposed to move very quickly, very fast, without the opportunity of uh, community involvement and input. Um, but the process was slowed, um, and um, there was, at the same time, a developing a uh, pretty strong and robust community coalition of nurses, doctors, other health care workers, community associations, elected officials, tenants associations to stop um, the closure. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys even got a bit of, uh, I should suppose, a little celebrity assistance from uh, gentleman Michael Shannon, who's going to play General Zod in the upcoming Man of Steel That's movie. Correct. Was that was that a big deal for you guys, for a, a Hollywood actor to come out uh, for assistance? Well, that was great, although he's a very humble man and identified himself as a neighbor. We were having a rally in Red Hook, and he spoke there. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some brass tacks as it regards to some numbers. Um, you know, what are the numbers as regards to the number of jobs that, uh, that may be lost if LICH closes down? Well, um, we believe it's about 2,000 jobs 
in um, at the uh, Long Island College campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what sense is it? What is the you know? SUNY has th thrown out a lot of numbers to us, saying you know, like it's losing a million dollars a week. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of what is there credence to that? Is that the the hospital is losing that kind of money per week? Well, the hospital, SUNY is going to have to explain that to any operator who's going to take over the hospital. And, um, you know, we don't know that. We don't know that those numbers are accurate. Um, but we're not really prepared to comment at this point on their books. Okay. All right. So as regards to um, just this issue of layoff notices, before we came into the studio, we talked a little bit about layoff notices and how quickly these layoff notices came and so forth. Let's talk just a little bit to talk a little bit about this issue of the layoff notices that we, we talked about before camera. Well, when the SUNY trustees voted to close Long Island College Hospital, they did so at a, a meeting. They actually had to do it twice because the first time um, it, they uh, violated the open meetings law, the New York State open meetings law. So they uh, moved their um, proceedings to purchase New York and uh, we were up there, so were community groups, to hear the uh, vote on the closure. Uh, the, hosp the, uh, the trustees voted to close the hospital. And that afternoon, um, SUNY Downstate sent out warn notices to the employees uh, at Long Island College Hospital. Um, if any, any, or any um, employer in New York State who seeks to um, lay off or close operations, lay off more than 50 people, must send uh, a notice, a uh, 90 day notice to employees. So that was sent out. Um, since that time, um, the closure plan uh, has been stopped. So um, we would expect uh, that uh, SUNY Downstate would withdraw the warn notice, the 90 day notice. And in fact, we spoke with SUNY management, with um, hospital management last week we understand they told us there are no plans for layoffs at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what is the current date on the... The current date is June 18th, um, but there are no plans for layoff at this time. I see, I see. Now, we did... We would expect them to rescind those la layoff notices uh, just as a matter of fairness to the employees. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you talked about the fact that the, the nurses are hopeful and so forth. When you guys started this uh, all these months ago, was this the kind of turnout that, was this the result rather that you were looking for as regards to a reprieve, if you will, or, or simply a matter of, hey, listen, if SUNY can't, you know, fund us, let's get somebody else who can. Right. I mean, w we want to keep the hospital open for care. We would like to see an operator that puts patient care before profits. This is what we're fighting for. This hospital has been around for uh, more than 150 years. It treats patients. The need for the hospital is apparent. In 2012 alone, the average uh, daily census, it was 90% occupied on average, whether the... You know, and it was there for Sandy. It was there to give flu shots in one of the worst flu seasons in the world. It's there now. A third of the emergency cases at the new Barclay Center go to this hospital. It is there for uh, Red Hook and the surrounding communities for Gowanus. It is a needed hospital. So we wanted to, we want to keep it open and we, our nurses want to be providing care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the the legacy, if you will, of this this hospital. Is it a? If, would you say, describe it as a beloved hospital in the Cobble Hill neighborhood? I would say, yeah, a beloved hospital, a needed hospital, and it is a hospital that has a lot of uh, real strengths in it. It's a good hospital. Um, it has uh, very strong departments: pulmonary, neurosurgery. It has the only strike stroke unit in the uh, borough of Brooklyn. It can do emergency cardiac surgery procedures 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, it is a definitely a needed facility. The hospital itself has, has had to deal with, you know, shortages and so forth. There's been reports of shortages. Right now, you know, how do things stand at uh, LICH? You know, there were reports, many of those were corrected, um, and right now the hospital is performing surgeries, it is caring for patients who come into a very busy emergency room, a very busy critical care units. So 
they are taking care of patients and giving excellent care. And in, in the end, we're going to, you know, just last question before we wrap. Um, what are you guys, the, the union, looking forward to as regards to what will come out of this at the end of all of this? We're looking forward to the hospital staying open as a full service hospital and continuing to provide the care it has provided for more than 150 years to this community and to Brooklyn at large. Remember, um, the hospital sees patients from the surrounding areas but from other neighborhoods as well. From Red Hook, as I mentioned, Bed-Stuy, uh, Crown Heights, patients come all over. Um, to see doctors, to have procedures done, and to have emergency care. Well, best of luck with your endeavors, Mickey Green. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. You can learn more about the campaign to keep Brooklyn hospitals open at facebook.com slash open for care. Still to come on the show, why is the city's housing authority trying to privatize some public housing? Before that, Sarah Pizon has some other news. Thanks, Viranara. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. Harlem hospital patients are being poorly cared for. Amsterdam News reports that shorthanded nursing staffs, poor bathroom conditions, and supply shortages are making patient stays a dangerous and unpleasant experience. New York State ranks third when it comes to nursing shortages. Statistics show that there is a need for over 390,000 registered and certified nurses. Jill Ferrillo, the executive director of the New York State Nurses Association, says Mayor Michael Bloomberg has failed to invest in adequate staffing at the city's health and hospital corporation hospitals, threatening the future of public hospital programs. From El Dior La Prenza, New York City public schools that are in the worst state of repair have a majority of Hispanic students. A new report by the Service Employees International Union says years of deferred maintenance and inadequate facilities funding has taken a toll on public school buildings and the city's most vulnerable Hispanic populations. The report was released after reviewing city inspections over the past two years. Broken windows and doors, severely damaged bathrooms, and PCBs were commonly found. The report links poor conditions of school facilities with deteriorating academic performance. Six months after Hurricane Sandy struck, and many New York residents are still dealing with mold problems. The Brooklyn Bureau reports that several Sandy advocacy surveys claim that thousands of homes in the Rockaways and Staten Island have developed mold since the superstorm. The surveys find that more than one-third of households that attempted some form of mold removal were unsuccessful. NYCHA has taken steps to reduce the mold problem by launching home inspections distributing mold supply kits. The Alliance for a Just Rebuilding has criticized NYCHA's efforts as inadequate. Instead, it has proposed a community-driven program called Back Home, Back to Work. The program would use local dislocated workers to eradicate mold on a block-to-block -block basis while reducing unemployment. About 13% of Asian Americans in New York lack health insurance, but not the Filipino community. Phil M. reports that according to data from the American Community Survey of the U.S. Census, 78% of Filipinos are insured with private companies. The publication reports that within the care community, many caregivers and nannies are insured with the most basic insurance. Despite the considerable number of undocumented immigrants who are restricted from buying insurance on the health benefit exchange, health advocate Becca Telzak says there are other ways immigrants can get covered. One of them is through the Emergency Medicaid, a health insurance exchange in New York offered to undocumented individuals. And finally, City Limits reports that the number of people living underground has increased by 12% in the last year. Though the number of people estimated to be living in the streets has decreased more than 2%. The Department of Homeless Services, DHS, says combining the two categories actually shows the number of unsheltered people overall has increased. The DHS acknowledges that the subway numbers are challenging but also note that the figures could have increased because the surveys have gotten better at counting individuals. Those were just a few stories from the ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org hunger and find your local food bank today. 
The New York City Housing Authority is facing criticism for its plan to lease land on public housing sites to luxury developers. The plan is a means for the cash-strapped organization to make headway on backlogged repairs estimated to be in the millions. NYCHA has targeted 13 sites in eight public housing developments in Manhattan, stretching from Harlem to the Lower East Side. Over 20,000 people live on these various sites, and many of them have already complained that this may lead to the gentrification of their neighborhoods, and possibly many of them being forced out of their homes. I spoke with City Limits contributor Batya Ungar Sargon about the info program and whether residents' fears are justified. But yeah, you, you've written uh, about uh, NYCHA's uh, troubles. Give us a general sense of how bad a shape, how bad a financial shape is uh, this agency in. So they're running at a uh, $60 million a year shortfall um, in terms of operational costs, but they also have a $1 billion a year shortfall in terms of capital maintenance, which means um, the buildings themselves, the elevators, the roofs, the maintenance of the actual, the capital stock is in a, a, a huge shortfall and um, the, the federal government has been drawing back on the amount of money that it's been giving NYCHA every year. They've been paying in the last 10 years about 90 cents on every dollar. So um, it seems that money and the solution is not going to be coming from the federal government. Why not? I'm not exactly sure why. Um, uh, public housing has been failing um, across the United States. Um, NYCHA is actually a huge success story if you look at other cities where um, you know public housing buildings have been demolished um, and uh, the cities themselves have been pulling out. So actually NYCHA is, uh, has been a huge success uh, in many ways. I mean socially it's a huge mix of different kinds of uh, income brackets and uh, different kinds of families and um, in terms of its management, um, just the fact that it's surviving uh, at this point, I think we should see it as a success. The question of um, what's going on internally, um, so uh, there's two things I, I, I think are important. Um, we've definitely seen that there have been problems managing money in NYCHA, but I think that um, they've been overstated a little bit. So, for example, um, uh, some news outlets have reported that um, there, you know, one billion dollars that were allotted to NYCHA have been left on the table. But if you actually look at the timeline that NYCHA was given to spend that money, they're well within that timeline. So they actually haven't missed they haven't missed any of their um, of the schedules for spending that kind of money. There was a big problem with um, the security cameras; took them a long time to get put up. I think just they just released a press a press release that those security cameras are going up. Um, so um, yes, there have been problems, but I think in a way, uh, you know, we need to focus on the problems that actually are as opposed to the problems that are not. There's been a lot of controversy over uh, NYCHA's difficulty in uh, dealing with, uh, with the repairs for, for these uh, developments. Talk about that. Yes, yeah. Uh, they had, uh, at the beginning of the year, they had uh, about 430,000 uh, repairs in backlog. Um, but they made a big push and about 113,000 of those have been resolved actually in the last three or four months. So NYCHA is aware of its problems. There are problems, but recently um, in response both to a series of um, uh, daily news articles over the summer as well as in response to um, the Boston Consulting Group's uh, recommendations, they have been trying to implement a series of um, uh, measures to overcome their problems. One of their latest uh, measures to deal with their budget shortfalls is the so-called infill plan. Uh, there's a lot of opposition to that. Where, where does this stand? It's a lease for uh, 99 years um, where uh, the, the developers would get um, a deal that they would build um, private market rate housing, 20% of which would be uh, for moderate income, so it would be um, uh, people making below 60% of the median income of the area, and 80% of it would be market rate housing. No low income, no. Um, no low income guaranteed, but a low income person could definitely apply for one of the 20% um, uh, apartments. Now, the question that a lot of advocates have put to NYCHA is, well, this is your land, this is your deal, why 80-20? That's any developer building in New York is offered this deal, this tax break, uh, in return for uh, leaving 20% of the, the units to be um, mar uh, not market rate, but uh, 
you know, moderate income, okay, so below that below 60% of the uh, median income. Um, and so why not put, you know, why not have 70-30 or 60-40 or have more of that be moderate or, as you say, lower income? And uh, what the chairman, John Ria, said to me about this was for every apartment that uh, he would, that, that goes in, that is not part of that tax break of the 80-20, so let's say we have, you know, so we have, let's say there's 100, 100 apartments, right, and 80 of them are going to be market rate and 20 of them are going to be uh, moderate income, that 21st apartment, because the realtor is not getting a tax break on that, John Ria says it will cost him $300,000. So because the point of this is to generate income for NYCHA, it's to get money for NYCHA. So the How much money would it cover for, though, just part of the, the overall debt that they're facing? Yes, absolutely. That's a really good question. So, how much do they intend? Do they intend to make? So, they they think that um, you know by 2015, I think the number they were looking at was something like 32 million. Um, which we can ask: Is that enough? Is that enough to you know for us to allow this to happen? For us to allow market rate housing to appear on NYCHA's land? Um, is that enough of a, a benefit for this big cost? And uh, all of the Democratic mayoral candidates oppose this uh, th th this um, uh, info plan. Um, where does the plan stand right now? What are the chances of it being implemented before the next uh, mayor? So the RFP has not yet gone out, and so that means that you know if we have until November, uh, how many months, right? So it would have to be seriously underway by November in order for this plan to actually happen because, as you say, all of the mayoral candidates, Democrats, um, have opposed it, whereas Bloomberg has been the one sort of the motor behind it. Um, so, you know, the, the question is, can you build, you know, can you build a luxury building uh, or a market rate building in uh, five, six months? Um, that's kind well, of the if they sign the contract, I, I guess um, that's that just gives them, them the green light. They don't have to build it. They would just have to sign the contract before the the next mayor. Is yeah, that right? yeah, it's true. Um, although if the the um, call for proposals hasn't gone out yet, it's sort of it's uh, looking it's looking more and more dubious as as time goes on. The next uh, uh, the candidates for um, for mayor have uh, the Democratic ones that we've been talking about. They have been saying that they are looking forward to an overhaul of NYCHA and replacing the the leadership with somebody with uh, great expertise, with extensive expertise in the public sector. Um, what what are the feelings towards that um, from 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 the communities within NYCHA? The residents, you mean? Yes, the, the residents within NYCHA. I think uh, <laughs> they too are looking forward to. Um, uh, I think that um, residents have been. There definitely, there's been a lot of um, fear about the infill plan. Although I think, in a way, the um, candidates have been sort of playing to that fear rather than addressing the actual issues. So um, you know, there's been a lot of hysteria about the plan, and so rather than asking the questions, you know using you know the facts in order to gauge questions of value they well, they're yeah. losing people are losing their their gardens uh, seniors are, are are losing their open spaces and they're getting these big big uh, buildings without being even asked of of their opinions on the matter mm -hmm. shouldn't they be um, worried about this perspective so the uh, most of the most of the plans are for are most of the areas slated for building are parking lots um, and a f I think there's one or two basketball fields any green space NYCHA has committed to rebuilding and any parking spots they've committed to providing alternative parking um, it, I think it's a good question in terms of you know the the NYCHA was built on a model this tower in the park model where you have a high tower with a lot of open space so it's a really good question as to will they have enough open space Batia Ungar Sargon, thank you for being in studio with us today. Thank you. When we come back, what a new mayor may do about racial intolerance in the New York City Police Department.
And finally, two groups, the Manhattan Young Democrats and the Young Professionals Politically Engaged, recently joined forces to host the Democratic Millennial Mayoral Forum. During the event, hosted by former Governor David Patterson, former controller Bill Thompson, current controller John Liu, public advocate Bill de Blasio, and Sal Albanese addressed questions from some of New York City's most politically engaged young professionals. The topics ranged from racial tolerance within the NYPD to struggling schools in low-income communities. We take in a few scenes from that event held at the CUNY Graduate Center. We would like to un enroll a field plan for the next six months. It's going to put a Democrat back into Gracie Mansion. So we need to clap for that. If we look at what happened in 2009, of the 1.1 million people that voted, just under 10% of those were between the ages of 18 and 39. The figures were 150,000 out of a possible 1.7 million 18 to 39 year olds voted. That's 7% of the people that voted for Obama the year before. Had that figure been 14%, then not only would Bill Thompson have won by 100,000 votes, but we potentially would not be stop and frisked. Our children would potentially be educated rather than tested. And we would be discussing how we retain Gracie Mansion, not how we win it back. This reminds me of the first day I became governor. I don't know where I am. I don't know who else is here. And I don't know how I got here. So we are going to um, take questions for these candidates. As a mayor, how do you plan to promote racial tolerance within the NYPD? Stop and frisk is something that I, and I'm surprised I'm the only candidate running for mayor who says very clearly that stop and frisk must be abolished here in the city of New York. The first thing we need to do is have a mayor who understands that stop and frisk, the way it is being used, is wrong, that it's being misused and abused, and we have a new police commissioner for the city of New York. Uh, and thirdly, I think we have to reform our drug laws and stop criminalizing so many of our, our young people. Um. What specific resources would you, as mayor, put in place to ensure that high-need students, particularly young immigrants and students uh, with low-income families, receive the holistic support they need to stay in school, pursue higher education and career success, and then eventually give back to their communities. Here's what I propose, and it is controversial and it is necessary. A tax on the wealthiest New Yorkers. Those who make a half million or more, so we can have full day universal pre-K and a guaranteed after school seat. A guaranteed after school seat for every middle school child who needs it. I want to establish a department for early learning where we start working with these kids in low income communities as soon as they're born. Uh, were you concerned uh, when you first learned of the uh, NYPD surveillance program of Muslims in, in New York City um, and really across the Northeast? And second question is, as mayor, would you call for an investigation inst into the constitutionality of the program? Targeting people because of what religion they worship is just wrong. It is as simple as that. It is not under Thompson administration, we wouldn't do that. We're gonna be launching a campaign, campaign called Vote and Frisk. The central idea of that campaign is if you're not represented in the polls, if you do not financially support your candidates, and if you do not help them win, then you become policy irrelevant. And the one thing we do not want to be is policy irrelevant. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. Thank you.